question if anybody would be interested in hearing the manifesto that Jodi Arias had created when she was being accused of murdering Travis Alexander and a few of you had expressed an interest so that's what I'm going to be doing today her manifesto starts off with a bit of a preamble explaining why it is that she wrote one in the first place and her the prosecutor actually had a different opinion as to why she created the manifesto and that was because she felt that she was going to get off on this murder and that she'd be she'd be able to make quite a bit of money uh, once she was acquitted and so I tend to believe the prosecutor over Jody herself but anyway so um right now that's what I'm going to be doing it's quite lengthy so I don't uh, really expect anybody to really listen to through to its entirety because it is 36 pages long and even though Jody seems to have a fairly good grasp of the English language she uses run-on sentences there are a bunch of like contextual errors there are a bunch of grammatical errors but in order to maintain the integrity of the document itself I'm going to read it just as is I'm not going to change anything around about it so feel free to take a listen obviously you know some of it's incredibly boring like the very beginning of the manifesto is kind of like kind of boring to be honest it doesn't really get interesting to like maybe the midway mark or so but you know if you know the Jody Arias case as well as well somebody like me who watched the entire trial and was quite I don't know intrigued with the psychopathy of this woman I think you might appreciate it um, so there are going to be some bits in here that sound uh, like some days well, I did this in like three days and some days I was feeling better than others some days I was a little more congested than others one day my dog was next to me and he was yawning and scratching you know doing dog dog things um but I did the best I could do and I'm happy to say that I've finally finished it so that's what you're going to be hearing tonight if you are in fact listening okay so I hope you um enjoy listening and that's about it okay so it's going to start right now following a recent interview it was brought to my attention that the interviewers questions will not be included as part of the sound feed when it airs prior to this discovery I was already moderately concerned with how my own words will be edited, spliced, and portrayed. But my level of concern has risen considerably in light of this new information. I realize, too, that this may be the case with every subsequent interview, regardless of the broadcasting station or publication. Therefore, I am posting here every detail from start to finish, uncut, unfiltered, and unadulterated, so that, regardless of how they wish to spin it, what is factual will be available to the public via the internet on this and other approved websites. The details set forth herein are relevant with regard to not only Travis Alexander, but also to a host of other matters surrounding me that have already become a subject of speculation, both on the internet and among a network of people. These details were never intended to be made known to the public. Under normal circumstances, they were intended to be kept private between my 
myself and the individuals with whom they concern. But since much of my life has now been thrust under a microscope, I feel it's necessary to set some records straight. I agreed to an interview for one reason and one reason only, for my voice to be heard. As a photographer, I am accustomed to being behind the camera, not in front of it, but the desire to be heard outweighed the desire to remain in my comfort zone, and therefore compelled me to get uncomfortable. Another reason for this composition is to address a few of the paltry and uneducated opinions that have been expressed by otherwise seemingly intelligent people. By doing so, I hope to answer many questions as well as uproot a lot of current speculation. Perhaps it will also serve to give perfect strangers a better idea of the kind of person that I am, although it is probable that any interested parties up to this point have formed their own notions, even if they have never made a sincere effort to truly get to know me. I have not changed the names of any individuals mentioned. I have, however, refrained from using last names, except, of course, Travis's, and have used initials instead. I have not mentioned any names in addition to the ones that have already been presented to me by the interviewer, by detectives, or through recurring topics on the web. All others that are in connection with this situation, even in part, will, for now, remain anonymous, although their roles may be mentioned. The interviewer, whose name will remain anonymous, remarked, It sounds like you two are very much in love, in reference to Travis and me. A bold statement, I thought, and... I almost responded with, It sounds like you're looking for a dramatic story. But I held my tongue, as he had been very polite and tactful. I could understand how he might have drawn such a conclusion, after having perused the photo album I had created on MySpace, entitled, In Loving Memory of Travis Alexander, which displays just a handful of our many travels and excursions. The truth was, I held back a lot in our relationship, never fully giving my heart over. Prior to dating Travis, I was in a four-year relationship with a wonderful man, Daryl B., with whom I fell flat on my face in love. Daryl and I had different long-term goals, which we were both aware of from the beginning, and which eventually led us down separate paths. So, I approached a relationship with Travis with a bit of reservation, which I think never fully melted away. It is common knowledge that loving someone and being in love can mean two different things entirely. Travis and I cared for each other and loved each other very much, but if we were ever in love, it was short-lived. I met Travis in September 2006 at the Rainforest Cafe at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. He walked right up to me and said, Hi, I'm Travis. We shook hands, exchanged the usual niceties, but in that moment, his was just another new name and face I had to remember. I met hundreds of people that weekend, as we and thousands upon thousands of 
others had descended upon the place to attend to an international convention. As I left the restaurant with my friends and walked throughout the casino, Travis made a point to walk next to me and keep me engaged in conversation. There was no initial magnetic attraction that I could feel, but in that short time, we discovered a few common interests. Traveling, the UFC, the San Francisco 49ers, and the desire to create an amazing life. It was clear that he had read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. He wanted to know all about me, and, as human nature would have it, I enjoyed talking about myself. When he discovered I was fluent in Spanish, he announced that he could give instructions on how to pee in a cup in Spanish, which he had learned to do in a previous job where he had tested people's urine for drugs. I said, let's hear it and he proceeded to give me step-by-step -step instructions with near-perfect fluency. It wasn't until my friend and I returned to our hotel room that night, and one of them said, Jody, I think Travis really likes you, that I'd given our interaction any further thought. And it wasn't until several months following that night that we began dating at which time I asked him about it, and he said, from that moment, he had first approached me he had an agenda. On the final day of the convention that weekend, during one of the sessions, we were listening to a speaker when Travis gently nudged me with his elbow. I looked over, and he was showing me in his journal where he had written me a question. What is your favorite part of the convention so far? I pondered the question for a moment, remembering a few of the most moving speeches I'd ever heard made on stage that very weekend. But that wasn't it. I knew that even if I never saw Travis again, he had made the experience of that weekend more fun and interesting than I could have expected. So in the spirit of honesty and spontaneity, I lifted the journal from his lap and the pen from his hand and wrote underneath the question, Meeting you, with a big smiley face next to it. I handed the journal back to him and he read it. Maybe he was being dramatic, but it seemed like he was going to fall out of his chair. The biggest grin spread across his face. We both smiled. I continued listening to the speaker on stage while Travis was leaning over his journal. A minute later, he handed it back to me. He had drawn a gigantic smiley face underneath our correspondence. Again, we both smiled. Later that evening, we decided to escape the mastermind group and went for a walk. We came upon a little park bench against the wall. It seemed to be the only place to sit in the entire casino away from the food court and the crowd. It was already 1 a.m., and that end of the building was empty. We sat down and talked for hours. Two things in particular will always stay with me about that conversation that night. One, he told me that he had always believed that nobody should ever sell themselves short by settling for mediocrity. Not in relationships, not in careers, and especially not in the pursuit of dreams. I soon learned that such philosophies and forward thinking were typical and characteristic of Travis. The second thing I will always remember was his inquiry of my religious and spiritual beliefs. I knew by that point that he was Mormon, but I knew nothing of 
the Mormon faith. I had always thought it was just another Christian denomination, hardly distinguishable from the others. Up until that point in my life, I had run the gamut of other religions, weighing carefully each one, taking bits of truth along the way. At the time Travis posed the question, my own spiritual beliefs were not the most harmonious with a certain traditional Christian doctrine, so I decided to approach the subject in a delicate manner. I deliberately remained somewhat broad in general, though truthful, saying that of some things I am certain, but I don't have all the answers. I was still searching and seeking, considering all possibilities. He was silent, and he seemed to be contemplating what I had said, and what to say next. After a moment, he said, Well, the best answer you could have given was, a Mormon. The second best answer was, what you just said. That comment struck me as arrogant. Another trait I quickly found to be characteristic of Travis, but it was a trait that was well mediated by a refined sense of humor, self-confidence, and charm. A week after we met, he invited me to accompany him and some friends to church in Murrieta, California. I accepted. That following Wednesday, on his way back to Mesa, Arizona, we met at Starbucks in Palm Desert, California, the city where I was living at the time. It was there that he gave me a copy of the Book of Mormon. I remember that day very clearly. We were sitting at a table outside in the shade. Napoleon next to us on a leash as he was holding the hardcover copy of the book in his hands. I remember the silver CTR ring on his right middle finger. He seemed to be searching for the right words. He finally said, Just read the introduction first and, when you have time, read the testimony of Joseph Smith. By the time he called the next day, I was several chapters into the first book in the Book of Mormon. I continued diligently investigating the church, utilizing a wealth of resources. In the ensuing weeks, I found, to my great surprise, that my beliefs were very much in harmony with Mormon doctrine the same doctrine that distinguishes the Mormon church from other churches. On November 26, 2006, Travis baptized me in Palm Desert. One week later, I was confirmed as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It was one of the greatest experiences of my life and one of the best decisions I have ever made. By the time Christmas 2006 had arrived, Travis had grown to mean very much to me. His propensity for generosity found a sure outlet through gift-giving. He was determined to Mormonize me. That Christmas, I received from him a complete set of scriptures with my name engraved on them. He also gave me a CTR ring, a framed copy of Families, a proclamation to the world by the First Presidency of the Church, a framed picture of Jesus Christ, a CTR decal sticker, and a book entitled Go Forward with Faith which is a biography of Gordon B. Hinckley, plus a host of other unrelated items. He nearly topped himself the following Christmas. He bestowed me with a BYU football shirt, scripture markers, a hymn book with my name engraved on it, and a full CD set. 
Travis always managed to make me feel guilty about it. To my knowledge, we had always been plain and open with one another, so there was no reason to keep such things from him. But out of tact and respect, I withheld certain details. We finally decided to make things official on February 2nd, 2007. From that point, a succession of road trips between Mesa and Palm Desert began between the two of us, as well as plans to fulfill our mutual passion for traveling. We decided that we were going to see every site in the country that was significant to our church's history. We started in Missouri and, over the next several months, we traveled to Illinois, Ohio, New York, and Utah. One time, we decided to meet halfway in Ehrenberg, a small town situated on the California-Arizona border on Interstate 10. We spent two days there holed up in a motel room, leaving only to dine at a neighboring truck stop restaurant and to catch a movie. Prior to arriving at the movie theater, we came to a stop sign where there was a homeless, dejected woman holding a sign made from a dirty scrap of cardboard with words that were barely legible scribbled onto it. We pulled up next to her, rolled down the window on the passenger side where I was sitting, and Travis leaned over and asked the woman if she was hungry. She said, yes, and with that, he turned the car around and drove to Wendy's, where he bought the biggest meal on the menu and a large soda. We drove back to where she was standing and we handed her the hot mail. She responded with a short, thanks, and taking the food and her sign, she found a seat on a nearby rock and began to greedily slurp down the soda. That was just one of so many countless times Travis exhibited Christ-like charity. It reminds me of a scripture in the New Testament, Matthew 25, 40. And as much as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. The morning we were set to part ways from Ehrenberg and return home, we had breakfast. Travis, after having listed all the women he'd been with, an impressively long list, though not necessarily slept with, said, Right now, everyone thinks you're just another victim. The comment was a little unsettling, but I didn't inquire further about its meaning. I am so grateful for the experiences that we were able to share, and I will always treasure those memories. From the breathtaking expanse of Adamandi Amman, to the charm of Nauvoo, to the quiet reverence of the sacred grove, where little green glowing fireflies dot the air at dusk. While we were in the sacred grove, we parted for a brief period of time for silent and peaceful reflection and prayer. When we found each other again, Travis told me how He'd knelt down to pray, just the way he'd always imagined that Joseph Smith did when he received the first vision. It was the middle of spring 2007 when Travis discovered the book, One Thousand Places to See Before You Die, by Patricia Schultz. He was appalled to learn that he'd only seen eleven out of those 1,000 destination points around the globe. I didn't exactly trump that with only 
seven out of those 1,000 places. We set out to conquer the book. It would be a lifetime pursuit. Teaming up with some friends, we started with the Grand Canyon, then Sedona, where we explored vortices, visited a Buddhist shrine, and had lunch on the river with the same paradisical backdrop that has adorned calendars and the like since the dawn of photography. Coinciding our visit to the Kirtland Temple in Ohio, we made a stop in Cleveland to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, then Niagara Falls and the Finger Lakes in New York, all of which were on the list. Traveling with Travis was like traveling with your own personal comedian, serenader, and philosopher. There was never a shortage of laughter, nor song, nor stimulating conversation on a variety of subjects. Marriage was frequently and openly discussed. We both knew things would either go one way or the other, so we never bothered with dancing around the issue. We also discussed things like family structure and baby names. We never agreed on baby names. Travis was going to name his girls Reagan, Megan, Iris, or Hinkley, and there would be no compromises. When he referred to the future, he always included me. He used terms like we, us, our, etc. To me, this was a normal, natural progression. Despite our progress, there was one role put in place by Travis from the very beginning. His ex-girlfriend, Deanna R. could in no way find out about us. Now, of course, she would eventually, but according to him, the later, the better. He said that if she found out, she would freak out, and he didn't want to deal with her emotional meltdowns each time he made an attempt to move on and date someone else. But it wasn't solely because he didn't want to deal with her drama and interrogation, as he put it. But it was also because he genuinely cared for her and loved her deeply, and he did not want to hurt her. He often worried about her future prospects for marriage, and if she would ever find happiness. At times, he worried so much that we included her in our prayers together. It was clear that his love for her was great, and that although he had moved on, he wanted to preserve their friendship. But above all that, he hoped that she would find happiness. I was very understanding of this, as I had been in a similar situation in the past. What I found to be somewhat amusing was that this attitude toward Deanna continued even after we broke up. On a few occasions, when she came over to his house while he wasn't there to wait for his return, we had been out running errands. When I dropped him off, I nearly had to keep the car rolling as he jumped out, all covert lest Deanna see us. To me, it was as entertaining as a sitcom to watch him juggle and struggle to keep the various aspects of his life from overlapping. It is true that I had very little sympathy for the stress this caused him, as it was he who had chosen to live his life in that manner. In May 2007, I decided to move out of my home in Palm Desert because I could no longer handle the mortgage. As this 
this inevitability had been on the horizon for some time, there was already a discussion of me moving to Mesa. Travis wanted to have me nearer, but again was worried, saying when Deanna finds out, however, it will be World War Three. I felt that I had been very tolerant and understanding given the circumstances up to that point. However, something just seemed off, not only about that situation, but about many things. In spite of Travis's objections, I followed my intuition and moved to Big Sur, California. He was not happy about the additional distance between us, even though we still saw each other on our trips together, so we began making plans for me to move to Mesa. Before I proceed with this timeline of events, I'd like to make it clear to the reader that it is not my intention to malign the character of anybody in any way. We all have faults and weaknesses, and up to this point, I have been very careful to protect Travis's reputation and my own. I am in no way proud of my conduct, nor of my decisions, which have not only indirectly led to my present set of circumstances, but have affected countless people on many levels. I make record of this now, because the nature of my relationship with Travis has been, and will continue to be, under scrutiny. It would be futile now to attempt to conceal such details, and unrealistic to expect that our relationship will not be further probed, and the results made publicly available. In addition, these are matters that will be discussed, examined, and cross-examined, and I do not wish to wait for due process until I am to be unburdened of that which I have made the mistake of trying to bear alone. Please keep this in mind as I disclose the following details to which very few individuals have been privy. It was no secret that Travis was very flirtatious. He was open about it. It was part of his charm. I did not consider it to be the most model behavior, but my own conduct was far from spotless in the same department. There was one incident in particular that summer of 2007 that gave me cause for concern. I could have just been imagining things, but there was something about the way he conducted himself that day that caused me to question his level of commitment to our relationship. I voiced my concerns to him in a calm, delicate manner, anticipating that he would dismiss my worries at the very least and then check his behavior in the future. But instead, he became very defensive. The conversation did not seem to be headed down a path of resolution, so he dropped it. I am not claiming to have any greater intuitive capacities than the next person, but I have been in enough relationships to recognize the dreadful and distinctive feeling that invariably accompanies unfaithfulness. I had not directly accused Travis of anything, yet he was adamant in his own defense. I left it alone, but I could not shake the feeling. One day, I took it upon myself to read the text messages in his phone, so as to either invalidate or substantiate my instinct. My justification was I had the right to know. I'm not saying
saying he was right. I fully expected to find flirtatious messages. What I found was that and much more, including several references of separate, intimate rendezvous with various girls that had taken place as well as planned in the making for further associations of the same kind. I checked the dates, hoping to find a way to excuse all of this, but as feared, they were all well within the time frame of when we began dating exclusively. Although I was shaking and my heart was racing, I decided to remain calm. I did not freak out. I didn't even tell him, partially because I knew it was wrong to go about investigating in such a manner, even though a part of me felt justified. One thing I did know was that we had a bought and already paid for vacation on the other side of the country less than two weeks away that was rapidly approaching. I decided it would be best to just try and get through the next few weeks before making any decisions as to how I was going to rock the boat. It did not turn out to be the best course of action. Holding it in made me miserable. Saying nothing when Travis asked me what's wrong wasn't fair to him either. Not only was I hurt and felt betrayed, I was feeling guilty over my investigative ways and because, in a sense, I had betrayed him, too. Finally, on June 29th, 2007, it all came out. That was a rough day for both of us, and it officially marked the end of our relationship as we knew it. We each had reasons to be ashamed of ourselves. We were both hurting, and we both had violated each other's trust on a deep level. I told him that it was obvious neither of us was ready for a relationship, not of the kind we had been fooling ourselves into thinking that we had. It was especially hard because he asked me to stay and marry him, promising things would be different. I used to wonder what it would have been like if I had instead accepted his proposal, but I do not think his behavior would have changed. I will explain why a little later in this composition. Prior to this heartbreaking chain of events, a proposal would have been likely joyfully accepted. However, by then, the trust was shattered. And when there is no foundation of trust, rebuilding is a slow and arduous process. Wounds were too fresh. I felt we needed a little time to heal. Forgive him. Of course I would. It is commanded of me. Not only that, but harboring resentment requires too much precious energy. Breakups are never easy. But each one prior to this has served to make me a little bit stronger and wiser. This was no exception. As hard as the day was, I am grateful for the experience and how it had added to my strength and wisdom. When all of this occurred, my impending move to Mesa was nearly finalized. But... Given this new set of circumstances, I hesitated, exploring other options. Travis, however, can be a very persuasive man, and at the end of his persuasion, I folded and decided to follow through with the move. Although I had suggested that we keep things at a just friend level, we hardly possessed the discipline to keep it that way. But, in order to avoid fielding too many questions from others, we kept our private life behind closed bedroom doors. This arrangement 
unchanged following our breakup was our mutual passion for traveling. We continued to travel extensively, chipping away at the list of 1,000 places. Keeping pace in our pursuit, we saw eight more places on the list together over the next eight months. Number one, the Balloon Fiesta, Albuquerque, New Mexico, where nearly 1,000 hot air balloons launch at dawn, sprinkling the sky with every color of the rainbow. We also had a memorable dinner that weekend. Frog legs, buffalo burgers, and alligator tacos. The next night, we ate chicken hearts at Tucanos. Our philosophy was, the freakier the food, the more fun it would be to retell the experience. Number two. 10,000 Waves Spa, Santa Fe, New Mexico, where they are renowned for their mineral hot baths, which are clothing optional. Although they are community hot baths hosting plenty of strangers, Travis had no qualms about jumping right in wearing nothing but his birthday suit. His confidence boosted my own and I followed suit. There was also some comfort in the anonymity that comes with being in a city far away from home. Plus, we had reasoned that we had to do it that way to get the full experience. Number 3. Route 66, Albuquerque and Gallup, New Mexico. After having lunch at one of the historic hotels and taking lots of pictures, a nice Jehovah's Witness couple approached us in the parking lot. They cut it short when they discovered we were LDS. Number 4. Cumbres and Toltec Scenic Railroad, Chama, New Mexico. Travis had been especially excited for this one because he had never been on a train before. The train ride took us over the border to Osir, Colorado and back, all somewhat close to the old stomping grounds of his mission. In addition to that, the Aspens had all turned to gold, creating a dramatic contrast to the dark evergreens. Number 5. UFO Museum, Roswell, New Mexico. We got our $5 worth, but it was nothing we couldn't experience via Google or from a few good episodes of the X-Files. Number 6. Carlsbad Caverns, Carlsbad, New Mexico. Amazing. Geological proof of the existence of a divine mind and creator. Getting there was a challenge. It was my turn to drive while Travis slept, and I ended up taking us 92.8 miles in the wrong direction. I was scared to wake up Travis and tell him of my blunder. My driving was the subject of 80% of our arguments. He kept his cool, though, and because we were driving his Toyota Prius, it hardly put a dent in the level of gas. Number 7. Cattleman's Steakhouse, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. After driving halfway across the country to get to a convention, we rewarded ourselves with a hot, hearty dinner and a delicious dessert. Our server brought us a complimentary sample of lamb fries, breaded, fried lamb testicles. Another freaky thing we got to brag about eating. Number 8. Anasazi Ruins, Chinle, Arizona. This stop stands out for many 
many reasons. It was March 2008. This was the last place on the list that I saw with Travis and the last road trip we ever took together. That day, when we stopped to buy gas, we got out of the car and we were shocked to see that there were three timid, submissive dogs that had approached us. They had a patient, pleading look in their eyes. They appeared hungry, starving even, as we could see their ribs through their fur. Even more heart-wrenching was that it was evident one was nursing puppies. We were moved and outraged at their condition, and using the last of our money, we bought them all stacks of hamburgers to share. They inhaled them all, as if they had a strong fear of loss, as if their food might disappear before they could get it into their bellies. Still hungry, we emptied the car of all the food we had, beef jerky and sun chips. It wasn't the healthiest meal, but they would have full stomachs that night. Their condition especially disturbed Travis and made him miss his dog Napoleon even more, whom he loved like a first-born son. He could not wait for us to get back so he could pick him up from Deanna's place, where she was graciously caring for him while we were away. Another covert operation. We made several other trips as well, some with friends, some just the two of us. We hiked into Hefezupai. We saw the Painted Desert and the largest cross in the Western Hemisphere. We almost saw the Meteor Crater, but we arrived five minutes after they closed the gates, which was my fault because we got pulled over for speeding while I was driving. Our out-of-town excursions were always more fun because we could relax and did not have to worry about being seen together by people that might know us. Travis often expressed concern over this, saying he does not like to be questioned about his personal life by other people. I'm a private person, he would always say. It was quirky, but I didn't mind. We were both single now, or so I thought, and there was a lot of freedom in enjoying each other's company without the obligations and expectations that come from being tied up in a committed relationship. We were comfortable. That, unfortunately, was part of the problem. When people get comfortable, there's often little inclination to change. I'm not proud to say our relationship became a thing of convenience. Despite the fact that our trust on nearly every level was almost non-existent, one thing that we could trust each other with was safety and discretion. I was by no means the first girl in his life to come along and enable such behavior. But that does not excuse the fact that we both knew better and should have been stronger. It became obvious with time that things were not going to change as long as we lived in such a convenient proximity. So, in January 2008, I began to make tentative plans to move back to California. Spending Christmas in Wairika made me realize how much I missed my family and how much I had missed out in the last ten years in the lives of my little sister and brother, Joseph and Angela. In fact, the only thing that could 
could have prevented me from moving at that point is if I had somehow met my future husband. I went on plenty of dates with very nice people, but I never found him. As for Travis, I could not have said one way or another. We sort of adopted a don't ask, don't tell a policy when it came to our dating lives, though he occasionally bent the rules. Looking back, such a policy was conducive to the way we were accustomed to operating around each other. In fact, the subject of dating only came up a handful of times, three, maybe four, and each time, with the exception of one, it was Travis who brought it up, usually to tell me that he was not dating anyone. I operated under the assumption that he was telling the truth, figuring that when the time inevitably comes, he would tell me or I would hear it from a mutual friend, and it would be no major revelation. The only time I mentioned my dates to him was if he pressed me for an explanation as to why I did not answer my phone or respond to a text message right away. I mentioned earlier that I did not think Travis's unfaithful ways would have changed if I had stayed with him, even though he promised that he would be different. I later found the reason for my hunch. A few months prior to my move back to California, we decided to have a conversation in which we came clean about everything. I learned that during the time I had been living in Mesa, Travis had a girlfriend, Lisa A. I was a little shocked not because he had lied about dating someone and had cheated on yet another girlfriend, but because this time I was the other girl. I felt terrible, but I was hardly the victim. I felt bad for Lisa. It seemed to make more sense as to why he was a private person why we did not talk about our dating lives, etc. Had I known about this, I would have never participated in the kinds of activities that I did with Travis. I would not have stayed the night at his house when he invited me over, nor would I have felt it appropriate to be going on vacation alone together, fun as they were. The status of our relationship was simple. We were friends. Our rules for conduct, however, were more ambiguous. My philosophy was, as long as we were two consenting adults and nobody was getting hurt, then there was no harm. Ignoring, unfortunately, the potential spiritual harm that can result from such choices. My first impulse was to go to Lisa immediately and tell her, not just to appease my guilt, but because if it were me, and it had been in my prior relationship to Travis and other relationships too, I would want to know. By that time though, he and Lisa were no longer dating and Travis had already taken a decided interest in Mimi H. It was water under the bridge. Besides, going to Lisa at that point would have not only caused a lot of unnecessary drama and pain, but would have destroyed our friendship, mine and Travis's. Travis may not have been a good boyfriend, but he was an extraordinary friend. We all have faults and, even when he was at his worst, I never held it against him. I asked him if the feeling was mutual, 
and he joked that he did not think that she even knew he was male. We laughed. I reminded him of his natural skill for winning over the ladies. He said, Please, whatever you do, don't give me any dating advice. I get enough of that crap from Sky H. I'm sick of it. I can handle this. It was obviously a sore subject, so I did not inquire further. When it was my turn to divulge, things did not go well. I told him some of the dates I had been on, when and with whom, and he became very angry and flew into a rage. These were good people, but he didn't like them for reasons I considered to be purely the conjecture of his own mind. The more I tried to calm him down, the angrier he became. I did not understand why he was so upset at my attempts to move on, especially since he liked Mimi so much. We were in his bedroom and I got up to leave, but he held me back, shut his door, and said, No, 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 you're not leaving. Travis only became violent with me on two occasions. That day was the first time. Both the times he refrained from hitting me in the face, but he bruised other parts of my body. The second time, such an incident occurred was two days before I moved back to California in April 2008. It was a Tuesday morning, and later that evening we carpooled to the business briefing in Tempe, Arizona. Two associates that night actually joked, So what? Is Travis beating you now? When they noticed the dark purple bruises. They were difficult to hide unless I wanted to dress like it was winter in 95 degree weather. I went along with their jokes to protect his reputation. I know it is common for women in abusive relationships to protect their abuser and make excuses for him or her, but this was nothing like that. Travis and I were no longer in any kind of committed relationship, and I was moving in a matter of days, so I was unconcerned about further opportunities for such treatment. I knew that with hundreds of miles between us, there would be none. When things settled down, he always became extremely apologetic, not just after those two incidents, but after any of our arguments, especially the ones about my driving, saying he just worried about me. I'm not saying that it didn't hurt emotionally or that I didn't cry, but his remorse was sincere, and there was no way I could not forgive him. I knew that, despite his temper, he cared for me. Even after I moved to Wairika, Travis and I continued to make travel plans. He was originally slated to come to Wairika in the latter part of May 2008 to watch me sing the national anthem at the opening of an event held annually to honor the memory of my uncle who passed away some years ago. We were then planning to drive to the Oregon coast, visit Crater Lake, which he had seen when he was younger, but wanted to re-experience, and hopefully attend a Shakespeare play in Ashland, all three on the list of 1,000 places. Following that, his plan was to drive to Washington State to see more places and visit some old friends he had been promising to see for quite some time. But the trip was pushed back more than once, and it was finally rescheduled for the latter part of June 2008, after he returned from Cancun and prior to his departure to D.C. I had made travel plans of my own to Monterey, L.A., San Diego, and Utah during the week of June 2nd to June 6th, 2008. Travis learned of my travel plan 
suggested I scrap those plans and drive to Arizona instead to see him. I will not deny that it was tempting, but I felt it was important to stick to my itinerary, and I explained this to him as delicately as possible, also reminding him of his impending visit only a few weeks away, and how much fun we would have when he arrived. It was never easy to say no to Travis. He began to drill me, asking for my real motive for driving all the way to Utah. The conversation ended unpleasantly. I felt guilty and he acted hurt. On Monday, June 2nd, 2008, we spoke again when he called me around 3.30 a.m. He was in good spirits and we talked for approximately 45 minutes, mostly about Gordon B. Hinckley. Some of my favorite conversations with Travis were about the church. He seemed to be a bottomless well of knowledge regarding the church's history and gospel doctrine, and the spirit could always be felt when we discussed such topics. Again, the subject of my road trip came up. I was leaving that morning, but still I held my ground. He did not get upset this time. He remained calm, but like he always did so well, began to sweetly guilt me, saying, Okay, fine, I see how it is. You don't love me. You don't care. I knew he was joking, but he always had a way of pulling on my heartstrings. We hung up. His guilt trip was working. I felt guilty for not going to see him and was tempted to scrap my itinerary. But I was proud of myself for not giving in to his persuasion this time. My first stop was Redding, California, where I parked my Infinity G35 coupe and picked up a rental that was more fuel efficient. I then drove to Santa Cruz, where I met some friends downtown for a bite to eat and karaoke. I stayed in Monterey that night. The next day, Tuesday, June 3rd, 2008, I drove to Los Angeles area, where I was hoping to meet some friends and their new baby girl they'd welcomed into the world a few weeks prior. I reached Pasadena late and had not heard back from them. San Diego was a tentative stop on my itinerary to visit a friend and see Hotel Del Coronado also on the list. I decided would have to wait for another time though, and that I would drive to Utah from there. Before leaving Pasadena, I stopped at Starbucks for a strawberries and cream frappuccino. The line was long, but it was worth the wait. I made several calls that day along the way, including a few to Travis, where each time he reminded me that it was not too late to drive to Arizona instead. Again, the temptation was great and I'd even begun to consider it, but I delicately declined once more, reminding him again that it was just a matter of weeks before he'd be coming to visit. But even as we hung up, that familiar twittery feeling of anticipation began to sneak back up. Before leaving Pasadena on an impulse, I called Travis back and told him I was coming to Mesa and I'd be there before dawn. He said he'd wait up. I arrived at his house around 4.30 a.m. on June 4th, 2008. He and Naps were in his office waiting for me and watching silly videos on YouTube. Travis was happy to see me. 
the feeling was mutual. It had been months since I'd seen them, and it made me realize how much I missed them both. I was exhausted from driving all night, but Travis insisted on showing me more videos on YouTube.com and on giving me a demo of the correct way to punch his new punching bag. We finally went to sleep around 5 a.m. and slept until about 1 p.m. We hung out, among other things. I surprised him with the original handwritten copy of chapter one of his book, which I had in my possession for the purpose of typing and editing it. Although I emailed chapter one to him several weeks earlier so he could post it on his blog, I hadn't gotten around to dropping the original in the mail yet. We also tried looking at CDs with pictures from our various church history trips, but his computer had a virus and we were having a difficult time bringing up the disk drive. After a while, we gave up and went back upstairs. With Travis's permission, I took pictures of him in the shower. These were tasteful shots, waist up. We were going for a Calvin Klein advertisement sort of look. Travis had been working hard on sculpting his body and getting ready for the summer, and as a result, was feeling very comfortable in his own skin. The shots were turning out really well. As I was checking the photos and the camera, standing near the shower, I heard a loud pop. I'm certain I blacked out for a moment because the next thing I can remember was I was lying next to the bathtub. My head was throbbing and Travis was behind me screaming. It was a sound that will haunt me for a very long time. I looked over to where his screams were coming from and he was in the middle of the floor on all fours. I looked around and could see in the hallway of the bathroom two individuals approaching us. They were covered head to toe in dark clothing and ski masks, although one was wearing denim jeans. I managed to get my feet and go into the closet hoping to get through the other door and possibly to a telephone. I don't know. My capacity to think was diminished. I was met at the other door with a gun pointed to my forehead. I was made to get down on my knees near the armoire and was told to stay there, not to move, not to speak. By this time, I'd gathered that one of all the perpetrators was female, and the other was male, the one wearing denim jeans. He was also the one with the gun. I stayed put on the floor. He left the room. I looked into the bathroom, where I could see the female perpetrator standing over Travis, who was silent now, but still on his hands and knees. I got up and rushed toward her and pushed her with all that I had. She fell over Travis and onto the floor. I pulled on Travis, trying to get him to come with me. I kept saying, come on, over and over, urging him to get up, but he wouldn't. He kept saying, I can't. With my help, he was able to move forward a few feet, but he said, I can't feel my legs. He told me to tell his neighbor. At that point, the woman came 
should kill me. What it seemed to boil down to was, she wanted to, he didn't. I don't remember every detail of the argument, but I can remember, he said. That's not what we're here for. He grabbed my purse on the dresser and began to comb through it. He didn't take anything except the cash that was in my wallet, and he went through the rest of its contents. He threw the purse down next to me and told me to get out. He said he knew who I was, where I lived, and where my family lives, and that if I wanted them to stay alive and I wanted to live, I would not breathe a word of this. Again, the gun was pointed at me. Before I could get out, the woman persisted and kept telling him to shoot me. She was standing over Travis in the hallway of the bathroom. I thought I was going to pass out at any moment. I was very dizzy. It is difficult enough to describe the feeling of having a gun pointed at your skull. It is even more difficult to describe when the one holding the gun is angry, stressed out, and under pressure to pull the trigger. It's like a void in the customary march of time as you wait for others to argue over your fate. He folded under the pressure and pulled the trigger. The gun didn't fire. I didn't wait around to find out why. I pushed past him and he seemed to make no effort to stop me. I flew down the stairs. I thought I could hear someone behind me, but I didn't look back to find out. There was no heightened sense of awareness during any of this. Everything was blind confusion. I left through the front door and slammed it behind me. I fumbled into the car and backed out of the driveway, all the while keeping my eye on the front door. It didn't open. I was still hyperventilating and feeling ready to pass out at any moment. I drove west down East Queensboro Avenue. I saw two young girls running the, down the street playing. It's one of the last memories I have of the Mountain Ranch neighborhood. My phone was dead. I'd forgotten to charge it the entire time I was at Travis's house. To be honest, I wouldn't have called anyone, even if I could have, remembering what they had said. I know that if they were capable of doing what they'd done, they were capable of carrying out their threats. I was terrified out of my mind by what I had just witnessed, and I drove for hours in shock not even aware of where I was going. After several hours, I realized I was in the middle of nowhere in the desert. I can't even say that I witnessed a murder that day. When I fled that place, Travis was still alive. We can all theorize how he might act in certain situations, but I never would have thought that I would have such a deficit of bravery. I am absolutely ashamed of the way I ran like a coward. I have two brothers, two sisters, and two parents, and all I could think of was their safety. For some reason, the faces of my father and my youngest brother kept playing in my mind especially. We live in a country that supports brave men and women who protect it every day. As well, they are trained to protect each other and not to leave each other behind. I wish I could say I were that caliber of a person. Some have argued that Travis was a dead man, that there was nothing I could have done. That argument brings me no comfort. I can't say for certain that I'd fought back harder. It would have changed anything. I have many regrets and much to be remorseful.
course will afford, but if I could change one thing, anything, I would have stayed and fought harder. I would have been valiant, even if the price of doing so was my own life. Under normal circumstances, I could not have taken the time nor expelled the energy required to compose this. As I mentioned earlier, some details, especially the ones surrounding the intimate, private life of Travis and I, were never intended to go beyond him and me. But these matters are out of my hands now. My privacy is out the window. So for those who wish to hypothesize further over the nature of our relationship, feel free. But I would suggest you do your homework prior to voicing unenlightened thoughts and opinions. The internet can offer a fair amount of anonymity, but based on what I've read so far of the content that has been posted, even Travis would say to some of you that you should be embarrassed for yourselves. As for the day Travis was attacked, this is not some fictitious concoction of my own imagination stemming from too much time on my hands. This is essentially what I told the detective who interviewed me well over a month ago from the date of this post. Regardless of the consequences for speaking out, I know what I am doing is right. I am unconcerned with how this will affect my case, as I do not believe that telling the truth can harm me in any way. As for the safety of my family, I must have faith that the Lord will not allow them to be put in harm's way, because I decided to choose the right. No matter the outcome, I am doing the right thing. And it brings me great comfort to know that one day, when it is my turn to be held accountable for my thoughts, words, and actions, when I am before the judgment seat of Christ, that Travis Alexander did not suffer at my hands, that they are not stained with his blood, and that the one responsible for taking his life will in fact be held accountable for what they've done on that same day. I'd like to address the remainder by category before I conclude. The topics were chosen based on questions that have been presented to me and on recurring themes on the web. So from here, Jody categorizes these certain points that she wants to make reference to. So I'm going to read those to you now. It starts off with Travis Alexander's funeral. There was a lot of talk because I did not make it to his funeral. It is true. I only made it to two out of the three memorial services held in his honor. Ironically, most of the people who made an issue of this were not present at the other two of his memorial services. But I never stooped to the petty level of gossiping about them. You know who you are, and so do I. I'd like to make record of the circumstances which prohibited my attendance. After using what fun I had and didn't have to fly to Arizona on the short notice, I was praying for the means to travel to Riverside on Saturday, June 21st, 2008. The means manifested themselves by way of an old friend, Matt M., who bought my round-trip ticket from Sacramento to Ontario, California. Transportation to and from both airports were secured. Sacramento, the nearest major airport to Wairika, is
is a four hour drive away. I got on the road in the middle of the night to ensure I arrived on time to board my plane. Not thirty minutes into my trip, I got a flat tire and I was forced to crawl to the next exit to a Chevron station in Weed, California. The place was deserted, and the elder lady working the graveyard shift at Chevron did not appear any more qualified to change a flat tire. And I came down even harder on myself because, not five months prior, Travis had shown me how to change a tire on his BMW. My infinity was not much different. The problem was, when he showed me that day in his garage, I wasn't paying attention. I'm daunted by my lack of knowledge and of the rain, I got out of my car and set to work figuring out the jack. Thirty minutes later, yes, thirty, I had loosened the bolt and had the car nearly all the way jacked up. Right about then, a gentleman drove up and walked past me into the Chevron store. On his way back out, he offered his help. I gratefully accepted, and he had the spare donut on and ready to roll in under ten minutes. I couldn't thank him enough. Unfortunately, I was still 3.5 hours from Sacramento and I could in no way drive that distance on my little spare tire. I made it to Reading, but it took a lot longer than usual, because I couldn't drive at normal speed. The tire center eventually got back on the road with the correct tire size, but by that time, I was too late to make my flight being still well over 100 miles from the airport. All other flights out of Sacramento to Ontario that day were later in the afternoon, defeating the purpose of traveling there as the funeral services began at 10 a.m. Travis and I once spoke briefly about our respective funerals. We were sitting in his office, I told him if I were ever called home before he was, it would mean a lot to me if he would speak at my funeral. He was a good speaker, and I knew he would edify me in an honorable way. He said, of course I will, but let's not talk about that stuff. We were silent for a moment, and as an afterthought I added, you know, my funeral would probably be held in Wairika. He got me off and said, Will you stop? Your funeral could be in Antarctica and I would still be there. I know he doesn't hold it against me, but I've held it against myself. The next point, Travis Alexander's tires. Sometime last year, prior to Christmas, the tires on Travis's BMW were slashed. Twice. Travis did ask me if I knew anything about it. He investigated it and even created his own little sting operation to try and catch the culprit. I urged him to file a police report, but he didn't feel it was necessary. He did, however decide to consult his sister Samantha and get her opinion. We decided to call her together, but he told me to remain quiet. We were both sitting in his office chair listening in. She asked him a series of deductive questions and said it could have possibly been me. He told her I'd agree to a polygraph if that's what it took to prove my innocence. When he hung up with her, he said he wasn't convinced it could have been me for a variety of reasons. One was the stealthiness with which it was done. He said both times it occurred, he was
was aware of it immediately, but he never heard or saw anybody, not even a car which could have been used as a getaway. In addition, he wasn't home when the incident occurred. I don't know where he was, but given the type of car that I drive at the time, which tended to stand out and could be easily heard, following him, even if I was inclined to waste my time, would have been impossible to do, and would not go unnoticed. At the time this occurred, Travis was aiding me financially to a small extent in exchange for cleaning his house on a bi-weekly basis. This was beneficial to us both, as I was experiencing my own streak of financial difficulty, and he reasoned that he was spending too much valuable time housekeeping. So I made extra money, and he enjoyed the benefits of a clean and tidy house, and more free time to complete tasks of greater importance. Even if I were capable of sinking to a level as to commit such a small-minded crime as vandalizing someone's car, I certainly would not have chosen his BMW. The cost of replacing eight low-profile tires amounted to over $1,100 money that was no doubt already committed to a formidable mortgage payment. Hurting Travis financially is not only in opposition to my most fundamental inner motivations, but it would have been hurting myself financially as well. That incident did affect me financially. Not only was he unable to pay me that month as a result of his obligation to replace his tires, he'd already gone far above and beyond the level of generosity so typical to his character, but he came to me and a few other friends for help to bring his checking account balance above zero. I remember it clearly. We were parked at the Valero gas station on the southwest corner of Ellsworth and Guadalupe. Travis had called me, stressed out of his mind that he was unable to meet his financial and business deadlines, screaming that he wanted to put a gun to his head and pull the trigger. It broke my heart when he spoke like that, I said. I know this doesn't fix anything right now, but I promise you that no matter how bad it gets, it will all be worth it. He was silent. Usually, it was he who gave advice, as he was more the mentor and I the student in our roles to one another. Besides, he hadn't called for advice, he had called for money and I lent him every last dollar to my name. Even though he talked that way about ending it all, when things would go awry in his world, he was never suicidal. He would just come down hard on himself when he failed to reach his daily, weekly, and monthly goals. It mattered not that he would accomplish more in one day than some do in a month. If his goals were not met and his list were not completed, then in his mind, he failed. During the subsequent month, he would occasionally bring up the subject of his tires, but only we argued. When the inevitable apology came, he would place his hands on my shoulders look directly into my eyes and say, Jody, I know you didn't slash my tires, and I'm sorry. The next point is our arguments. Travis and I argued a lot, too much. Sometimes it was over silly things, like the way I parked 
unpacked my suitcase or why my rearview mirror often faced the wrong way. Other things had more merit and came from a place of concern for my safety, like text messaging while I was driving or sleeping alone in my car on long road trips. Still, other things were totally confusing, like arguing over the guy I chose to date. He said it wasn't that I was dating other people that was the problem, but who? I felt it was my choice to date whomever I wanted. Sometimes it seemed like I was just his whipping girl, an outlet for him to relieve his pent-up frustration in more ways than one. Other times it seemed like he called me up with the sole mission to bring me down and ruin my day, filling it with negativity. As I mentioned earlier, he was always very apologetic. I was invariably approached with humble remorse. If it wasn't in person, then I got the inevitable call or text message filled with the sweetest words of apology. He said one day, he will be held accountable not just for his actions, but for every word ever uttered from his lips. He would remind me of the divine source from which we came, that I was a daughter of God. Again, there was no way I wouldn't forgive him. He'd been forgiven before he'd even apologized. Next point email. The interviewer asked me about this. There is no way to explain my way out of this. I read Travis's email. It's really that simple. The hows and whys, however, are more complex. In the weeks prior to dating Travis in January of 2007, I had gone on dates with other guys. There was potential for something more, with two in particular, but when things began to move with Travis and I, I let them both know I just wanted to be friends, one by email. Travis expressed great interest in the particular email, so I read it to him. He seemed to really enjoy the fact that I'd given this guy the Dear John letter because I preferred to be with him instead. One evening, the following week, while I was at my home in Palm Desert talking on the phone with Travis and surfing the internet, I heard a knock on my front door. It was 1.40 a.m. and I had no idea who it could be. I answered the door and there was Travis. He had driven to California without telling me and surprised me. I wasn't expecting company, so after letting him in, I ran to the bedroom to make myself more presentable, even though Travis insisted I looked the same as always. While I was in the other room fixing myself up, Travis got onto my laptop and began reading my email on MySpace including all of the previous correspondence with the guy who had been the recipient of the aforementioned letter. When I came back into the room, he blatantly confronted me, seeming to have no regard for the fact that he was snooping through my email. It didn't matter that this was all correspondence that took place prior to us officially dating. Somehow, he had managed to make me feel like it was me who had done something wrong. I found myself trying to explain until it occurred to me to ask him why he thought it was okay to be reading my email. He explained he was merely looking for the letter I'd sent to the guy that I had read to him previously. Either way, it was an uncomfortable situation for us both. A week and a half later, I decided to respond in kind by paying him a surprise visit to his house. 
we spent the whole weekend together. We were sitting in the big comfy chair next to his bed, clicking around in the internet, looking at pictures of plasticized bodies. After a while, Travis got up and started to clean his bedroom. I clicked the back button to browse the website further. I must have clicked one too many times because I came upon his MySpace email inbox. It was too tempting to resist, and flawed as my reasoning may have been, I figured he got into my email, and that was perfectly okay with him, so what the heck. I was pretty shocked at what I found, but I couldn't hold it against him. All of the email, scandalous as they were, were prior to when we began dating exclusively, which became official that weekend following a simple discussion, revealing that he wasn't dating anyone else and he didn't want me to date anyone else. I decided they were mostly inconsequential and that I wasn't going to mention it to him. One thing, however, that especially disturbed me was some of the naughty correspondence with married women in the church with families of their own. I won't drop any names. Ladies, you know who you are, for it is not my intention to create problems in anyone's marriage. It did lead me to question the sanctity of marriage. My record is not untarnished in that area either, though it is a far cry when compared to how far things went on his part. Either way, the issue is black and white. For the record, I regard marriage as a sacred binding covenant between two people, and I know that Travis also regarded marriage as an important and necessary step in his spiritual progression. Although I chose to keep quiet about what I discovered, partly because I felt it was inconsequential, and partly for fear of being reprimanded, I did, however, naively confide in Sky H, thinking that what I told her in confidence would remain between us. But she in turn told Holly G, who told Travis, who asked me about it. He was much cooler about it than I'd expected, probably because he knew he'd been guilty of the exact same thing. His only argument, and it was valid, was that I had known about his violation of my privacy, but I never told him of my violation of his. Another incident which occurred sometime last fall of 2007 was when I was at his house for the purpose of housekeeping. Travis was at the temple. It was a Wednesday evening. He accused me of reading his email because a friend had asked him about it, me being online. That, however, was a misunderstanding. I used Travis's computer that night pay bills online, and then jumped on later to check other account balances. At that time, I didn't have internet service at my own house. He had been logged on Gmail, and was composing a letter to a judge regarding a late payment on a traffic ticket. Okay, this much I read. Not wanting to disturb what he'd composed thus far, I minimized the window so I could complete my own business. Each time I got online, bringing his laptop out of hibernation mode, it showed his Gmail status online. I knew Gmail well enough to know that if it my intention to go reading his emails again, I would have at least gone under the radar by settling the setting the status to offline. Anyway, we, of course, argued about it when he got home. I left upset, swearing to myself I was never going to use his computer again, regardless of the fact that he'd granted me permission to do so anytime I needed. 
I'd barely left his neighborhood when he called me and told me to come back. I refused. I was too mad at him, so I didn't think it was a good idea. But he knew every one of my buttons, and knowing how to soften me was no exception. He said we couldn't go to bed mad at each other, and that I had to come back so we could make up. Caving into the temptation, I turned the car around and spent the night there. A few days following that incident, Travis and I were having lunch at Red Robin. He said, I have an idea that I think will help rebuild some trust issues between us. I said, you have my attention. He then explained to me that we should each exchange a password on an account of our choice. His reasoning was that if we could trust each other with a password, then that's a head start. I said, great, in fact, I'll give two passwords. Although I regretted the words as soon as I spoke them, but he wouldn't let me back out, so he compromised two for two. I gave him my Facebook and Gmail passwords, and he gave me his Facebook and MySpace passwords. They were both the same, Denver 77. I can't say that his idea ever really worked. If anything, I think it only created more unnecessary problems. Travis had also asked me about a dubious email that had been sent to Lisa A. sometime last winter in 2007. This was prior to my knowledge of their relationship, so I thought it strange that he was asking me about her, or if I had any knowledge of it. I told him no, but that he could easily trace the IP address from where it was sent and that should provide him the answer he was seeking. I don't know if he ever did, and he never asked me about it again. However, the source can still be verified, and if or when it is, it will no doubt be determined that it didn't come from my computer, and it most likely didn't come from any computer I may have access to. Next point, Cancun. Travis and I, and everyone else in our company, had known about the incentive a trip to Cancun, since it had been announced the year prior. Travis learned of his eligibility early in 2008. I simply must set the record straight on this, because the question was posed to me so many times. The idea of me accompanying Travis to Cancun was never entertained at least not by me that I know for sure. It was never a discussion. Although we were planning and scheming additional future adventures and road trips up to the day he passed away, this was never one of them. I didn't ask him who he was going to take for a few reasons. One, I figured if he wanted me to know, he'd tell me. Two, I thought it might be a touchy subject for him. Three, there was a part of me that didn't want to know anyway, despite my mild curiosity. It wasn't until Travis's memorial that I learned who he was taking. A woman named Brenda A. approached me. She had a look of confusion, and she said, Weren't you originally going to Cancun with Travis? I was surprised by such a question, but I answered, No, I was never going to Cancun with Travis. But she persisted, saying, Yeah, I thought you were going, but then he decided to take someone else. That was news to me, but I soon found out it was a popular rumor. So I asked, She replied, I can't remember her name. She seemed to be struggling to remember, but 
there was only one person I could think of that Travis would want to have by his side on that trip. So I said, was it Mimi, maybe? That seemed to trigger some recognition, and I later received confirmation of such. It was a bittersweet piece of information. Sweet, because I knew he must have been happy to have succeeded in getting the girl of his dreams, literally, to accompany him on this long-anticipated trip. Bitter, because it was a trip he would never take. With the knowledge and faith of what comes after this life, we can be comforted to remember that Travis has embarked upon a journey that dwarfs what would have been a trip to merely south of the border. Next point, Mimi, and then in parentheses it says Marie H. That's Mimi Hall. Given the fact that I've been asked about her a number of times, including by the interviewer, I feel that her own category is warranted. I can't say a lot about her. I only met her once, and beyond that, I only knew what Travis had shared with me through pictures and stories and a few dreams he had. One being so vivid, it still seemed real for several weeks afterward. She seems to be a nice girl, very spiritual and strong in the church. From what Travis told me, he felt she could very well be the one. I remember thinking, lucky guy, the agonizing search is over. I know he felt like he was racing against a ticking time bomb, which was set to go off on his 31st birthday. I remember a particular late night conversation after I'd moved to Wairika, when he was very short with me, again, bringing up the subject of other guys. He was interrogating me with one question after another over things we'd already been over and that I thought we'd long since resolved. I was left feeling a lot less happy than before he called, so I called him back and said my piece. His demeanor had completely softened and he sounded sleepy. He apologized, of course, and said he was just frustrated because he was lonely and things weren't moving along in his dating life as he'd hoped. I sympathized with him. We both wanted each other to be happy. I assumed he was talking about Mimi, but I didn't ask questions, I just listened. After Travis passed away, I learned from both ecclesiastical authority and from a detective that she told Travis she just wanted to be friends, despite the date and the trend the trip to Cancun. I was a little saddened to learn of this. If that didn't break his heart, it was no doubt a painful setback. We never talked about it. I believe that if he'd been given the chance, he would have won her heart. For those who are reading this that share the Mormon faith, we can probably agree that marriage and an eternal family is still a possibility for Travis. Next point, Travis Alexander's house. It's been said that I was always at Travis's house. Always? No. Often? Absolutely. Considering the time I logged at his house, one could say I practically lived there. If I thought for one moment that I'd be called into question over it, I might have thought twice about it. Might. The fact is, I was weak and undisciplined when it came to Travis's pressure and persuasion. When he said, come over, I came. If I was unresponsive to his text messages, he would call until I answered. Although, there were times when he called me late at night that 
didn't require me to leave my home. He'd say he was in the neighborhood or passing by, so he came to see me. But more often, I'd get a text message beckoning me to come see him. It was usually late at night, after the coast was clear. He'd alert me when company had left, roommates were asleep, and his day's work was done. On average, I spent two to three nights per week there. I'd usually stay until his roommate had gone to work in the morning or had stepped out, unless my own schedule required me to leave earlier. I'd park right in the driveway behind Travis's spot. He never seemed to mind this, although it was hardly incognito. There were some occasions when Travis asked me to stay at his house and care for Napoleon while he was out of town, traveling to somewhere other than California. On one of those occasions, he'd gone on a road trip to Salt Lake City, Utah, with some friends to attend General Conference in October 2007. What was interesting about this particular stay at his house was that Deanna had dropped by unexpectedly. I had cookies baking in the oven and was downstairs sitting on the couch with Napoleon when she walked in. I didn't recognize her at first. I thought she was his roommate's friend. Napoleon was happy to see her. When I realized who she was, it was a little awkward, but we were cordial and kind toward each other. She told me that she was there to look for a book. She went upstairs to Travis's room for a little while, then came back downstairs and went into his office. I was tending to several batches of cookies. Some were cooling, some were baking, and some were still waiting to go into the oven. When Deanna came out of the office, I offered her some, which she politely declined. We made small talk for a few minutes. She said she couldn't find the book. Then she left. I figured better Travis to hear it from me than from a hysterical Deanna, although she didn't seem nearly as emotional as the picture he'd painted. I let him know of her visit when he called me later that night. He said, I wonder what book she was looking for. I found out from him later that there was no book. She just made that up and had come by to visit Napoleon. The reason I bring this up is because the detective told me that she'd mentioned it to him when they spoke and that she thought it was strange that I was there. I thought it was more strange that she would drop by unannounced than it was for me to be there pet-sitting per Travis's request. According to Travis, Deanna wouldn't answer or return his calls for several weeks afterward, but he said that's just how she works and that she'd come around. The next time we talked about it was when he called me, and the first thing he said was, I just had a three-hour conversation with Deanna, trying to calm her down and explain why you were at my house. It sounded like another story he had to spin on my behalf. I said, wow, three hours. I already told her why I was there, and she seemed fine. He said, you don't understand, Deanna. I wondered if he wasn't exaggerating. When I met her, she seemed normal and nice, so it all let me wonder if she wasn't just being ingenuine. Either way, it wasn't my drama, and for that, I was glad. Besides spending time at his house, we carpooled together to weekly business meetings. He'd always swing by and pick me up. If friends ever questioned me about Travis, I simply edified him as a wonderful person and a good friend, which was a simplified truth. People questioned him about me, and for the most part, he returned the favor. However, he often lamented that certain friends of his would 
gave him a hard time about the time we spent together, which was not always as clandestine as we aimed to make it. So he found himself spinning stories or making excuses as to why we carpooled together, or why we sat next to each other. Whatever the situation happened to be, really, we were just comfortable. It was a convenient arrangement in more ways than one. I may have been weak in resisting his charms, but I was far from innocent. It takes two to tango, and admittedly, I was a willing participant. Neither of us had acted in the best way to facilitate moving on, although we'd both long since begun the process. Moving to California was one of the most significant steps I could have taken in that direction. I know that, for me, it made a world of difference. Looking back on it all, he was no more beguiled and seduced by me than I was by him. I hadn't fully escaped his influence after I moved, for we still talked frequently over the phone. But at least now, it wasn't leading to late night rendezvous at his house. I didn't have to say no to him. The distance said it for me. Next point, photographs. The provocative photos recovered from the memory card in Travis's camera are discussed at length under the section titled Evidence. I am a photographer. Since I received my first camera, I've been snapping pictures of everyone and everything. Travis was always an enthusiastic subject. He enjoyed having his picture taken, and he had a repertoire of many facial expressions, although he could be quite critical of himself. I literally have hundreds of pictures of Travis. A small fraction of a number when compared to the thousands of photos I have of family, friends, ex-boyfriends, pets, children, weddings, landscapes, the ocean, sunsets, sunrises, moonrises, electrical storms, and everything else, denoting that there is a god that makes up my entire photographic collections. Some of my favorite ones are not posted on the internet because he was self-conscious of the way he looked. We once did a photo shoot in his pinstripe suit and matching pinstripe hat. He was going to have one of those photographs enhanced so that it looked antique and then frame it and hang it next to a photo of one of his ancestors. Other pictures were from our trips to Disneyland or just driving in the car during one of our many travels. I took a really great one of him while he was getting frisked in airport security. That is just one of so many random captured memories that I will always cherish. I was asked why Travis didn't post any pictures of us on the internet, such as my space or Facebook. That subject only came up once while we were dating, and the reason he gave me was that he didn't want to hear it from Deanna. To my knowledge, Travis never posted any pictures of his girlfriends on the web. Not Deanna, not Linda, not Esther, not Lisa, not me. If I am wrong, then I apologize. I only know what he told me. All of this aside, I will always treasure the huge stock of photos, including some videos, that I have of Travis. I am so grateful for photography and how it has served to, do to document the most precious moments of my life, including many of the amazing experiences he and I shared. Next topic, 
my mugshot. There has been a lot of talk regarding my smile in my mugshot. I fully expected this. I smiled for a lot of reasons, so I'll recount them here. One simple reason is, I knew it would be all over the internet. Smiling was cocky, I know, but so was Travis. And anyone who knew Travis well enough to know he was cocky also knew what a happy and positive person he usually was. Which leads me to my next reason. I've thought a lot about Travis since his passing, and the day that photo was taken, he was especially the focus. So I asked myself, what would Travis do? Barring the fact that he would likely never get himself into such a situation, he would no doubt be flashing that grin of his that everyone loved. Another reason is, I really have no cause to be upset about my temporary detainment. I know the seriousness of what happened, but I also know of my own innocence, and I can breathe a huge sigh of relief to remember that, ultimately, things are in the hands of a god who is just and fair. I am still very much in control of my own fate. As bold as this may sound, I will not spend one day in an Arizona prison for a crime in which I had no part. Not one day. If anything, I'll be home for Christmas. Next point, the crime scene. The detective would not walk me through his version of the events because he was under the assumption that I knew how it all went down. All I really know was what happened before I blindly stormed out of there, and even that was a jumble of chaos. I asked him to show me pictures, but he said he didn't want those images to be in my mind the way they'll always be in his. His comment reminded me of Ecclesiastes, and much wisdom is much sorrow, and he who increaseth his knowledge increaseth his sorrow. Reliving that day for the detective, after I'd done all I could to repress it, was not only like reliving the drama, but it made me want to know all the more what they'd done. Thinking it might bring me some semblance of closure to have such knowledge, he did show me a photo of blood stains on a carpet. Travis was still in the hallway of the bathroom when I left, where all the flooring is tile. I don't know, and I'm not sure I want to know exactly how the carpet became stained in blood. That photo alone has stayed with me every day since. Looking back, I'm grateful he refused to show me the rest. Next subject, the evidence. I can't say much about the evidence. There was a lot taken from Travis's house. None of it proves I committed a murder, but much of it substantiates my statement made to detectives. I never went to Travis's house with the intent to commit a crime. Therefore, no effort was ever made on my part to cover my tracks. I fled that place and didn't look back. If I really were capable of committing such a heinous crime, especially premeditated, then I would be equally capable of trying to cover my tracks. With such things as, oh, I don't know, an alibi, maybe cash transactions for gasoline purchases instead of my debit card, maybe clean up or use gloves. I don't know. That sounds terrible, but I am inclined to believe that these would all be common measures to take, none of which would have even crossed my
my mind. I'm sure there would be other things to consider as well, but I'd only be guessing as I am no killer. If it were a crime of passion, then of course there would be a lack of premeditation, but the people who did this had a gun, at least one, because I was staring down its barrel. Travis was killed by a 25 caliber gun, which is by no means a rare gun type. Both of my parents and grandparents once owned guns of that caliber, both of which were stolen and never returned to them, and neither of them were in my possession. In fact, I've never even fired a gun. The closest I've come to doing so was when I legally purchased a 9mm handgun, which I picked up on Friday, July 11th, 2008. It was a purchase I've considered for years, but given the seriousness and responsibility that comes with its ownership, I'd put it off for some time. This year, I made a New Year's resolution to conquer three fears. Public speaking, skydiving, and guns. I had taken significant steps toward overcoming all three, but a gun and skydiving was just not yet in the budget for me. After my life and the lives of my family had been threatened, I felt a heightened sense of urgency to follow through with the purchase. Next point. My interview with detectives. A friend of mine has been coming to visit me consistently, and she's been quite the enlightening informant, filling me in on the latest circulating rumors surrounding my case, from the plausible to the utterly ridiculous. However, during one of these visits, she made my heart jump and my face flush with color because this time what she'd heard was no rumor. She said, I heard during your interview with the detectives that you did a handstand and you were singing. I stammered and fumbled for a response, but I was so caught off guard that all I came up with was, well, yes, that's true, but I can explain. It was actually a headstand as my arms do not possess the strength to hold up the weight of my body. I was interviewed for two days and for several hours on each occasion. There were many times when I was left in the room alone, and it got boring very quickly. During one of those times, upon awaiting the return of one of the detectives, in an attempt to amuse myself, I did a had to stand against the wall, and I'm always singing, humming, or whistling a tune. I don't remember what I was singing that day, but it was probably a church hymn. Now, of course, these interviews are recorded on video, and most likely my every move, mannerism, and response was being carefully studied and analyzed. But I am curious to know which individual who was privy to those tapes allowed such a detail to leak out and trickle all the way down to my friend who had come across this bit of information at the local gym of all places. I would never be upset over something so silly. I think there's a minor hiccup in the discretion and integrity of one or a few county employees is somewhat understandable, given the fact that the country has reacted as though it were the most talked about thing to happen in Wairika since the discovery of gold almost two centuries ago. That much, at least, was self-evident when the editor of the local newspaper thought if profitable to publish my picture on the top of fold of the front page. I'm not bragging. It is hardly 
something to be proud of. Since the topic of my conduct during these interviews appears to be just another course in the feast of gluttonous rumor mongers and busybodies that allow me to fill their plates with the following. Besides an initial and very poor attempt at denying the actual itinerary of my road trip, and then reliving the hideous nightmare, in addition to tears and periods of the lack thereof, while rooted in the absolute confidence of my innocence, I also fidgeted with voice recorders, which, at the time, were turned off for lack of battery power, removed some paper from a nearby printer, but didn't have a pen with which to write, sat on the floor next to my chair, studied a painting on the wall which bore a strong resemblance to an actual place southeast of Montague, California, with a little white chapel in the countryside and a quaint farmhouse, otherwise known as Little Shasta. Blew my nose, wiped away tears, cried some more, and peeked through a window with many blinds leading to another room, where I spied a plate of brownies on a table, not necessarily in that order. Next, motive. Simply put, I have no motive. I would have nothing to gain in my whole life to lose. I asked the detective what possible motive he thought there could be. He said, I don't know, anger, jealousy. Undoubtedly, I've been mad at Travis, but not that mad. Even when he was at his worst, hurling all sorts of creative and contemptible names in my direction, I never held it against him. He was just blowing off steam the way he always did, and then the inevitable apology would follow. In fact, I learned to argue with Travis in a way that would make our arguments blow over much more quickly. Just agree with him. Then we could get on with the good part, which was making up, or in the very least, just have peace. During one argument, he insisted that I admit that I hated him, which of course could never be further from the truth. But he would not give up until he heard me say it. So to appease him, I gave in. For it is when I appeased him in the midst of his rage that he'd settle down much faster than I attempted to fight a fire with fire by asserting my own stance and point of view. This also served as good practice in checking my own ego and pride. As far as Travis physically retaliating against me, it was hardly a thing to be angry about. It was no worse than what my own father had done on occasion as a means of discipline as I was growing up. Sorry, Dad, but it's true. I love you and wouldn't hold it against you. If anything, I was more stunned than angry over those two incidents. As far as jealousy, I actually looked up the word jealous in the dictionary to make sure I was accurate as possible in addressing this. I'm sure there were times when I was jealous. I can certainly remember the feeling from other past relationships, but with Travis, I remember more a general feeling of insecurity while we were dating. Even when I learned of his philandering, I was more shocked and hurt than jealous. Besides, he was hardly the first cheater to cross my path. He'd have to get in the back of a line of ex-boyfriends who've been guilty of the same folly. As Cancun, I roll my eyes that this could even be suggested as a motive. There is just no way I could break up with a guy and then expect him to take 
take me on a trip of that caliber almost a year after terminating the relationship. Like I previously stated, the idea of accompanying him was never a discussion. Next topic, composure. I have been asked on several occasions about my composure. I haven't a single doubt that no matter how I conduct myself, my mannerisms will be dissected and misconstrued. If I'm nervous and fidgety, I'm considered guilty. If I'm crying, it's considered an act. If I am calm in the face of a news camera, I am considered cold and calculating. If I mourn a Travis, I am said to feel guilty, supposing I participated in his murder. If I praise the wonderful person he was, and express how much I miss him, I am considered obsessed. There is no getting around these biased attempts at interpretation. One thing is certain. Undergoing the terrifying experience of being held at gunpoint alone was enough to send me into a state of total shock. Throw on top of that being attacked, the lives of my family members being threatened, witnessing my friend being attacked, subsequently receiving confirmation of his death, still being in shock and denial over his passing and barely entering the beginning stages of grief when being arrested and charged with one of the most serious crimes possible against the very person I am mourning, and then having every private detail of my life thus revealed to the world is just about enough to alter anyone's behavior and state of mind. If not permanently, then at the very least temporarily yet profoundly, especially when all of the above has not had a chance to be fully assimilated and processed. So the term shock is by far the most accurate, albeit an extremely mild description of the state I've been, for the large part drifting around, and since this onslaught of curiously fatalistic events that have populated the last several months of my life. In addition to that, I have a deep and abiding sense of faith that Travis is well, that he is not suffering. This knowing alone is enough to console me in a very deep way. Somehow, I can just feel his presence at times, and somehow, I just know he understands what I am going through. I cry each and every day just from grieving him, and I am not going to cry in the public's eye just for the sake of the public's satisfaction. I've shed thousands of tears since Travis is passing, yet I feel every bit of pressure to pull it together and maintain my composure when it's time to interact with law enforcement, attorneys, or especially the media. I am essentially creating a permanent, verifiable record of myself, and I refuse to be hysterical and I will summon every ounce of inner fortitude to keep my composure as best I can. Quite honestly, it is not difficult to remain detached when I've been dropped into a matrix of surroundings. I could never have imagined where I find myself in a completely foreign environment, interacting with a completely new set of people on topics I've never before deeply probed, let alone been the center of such probing. Worrying, stressing, panicking, and otherwise breaking down is not going to help my sanity, my health, nor the time to roll by any faster. I am reminded of one of my favorite stories, The Count of Monte Cristo, where the main character, Dante is thrown into prison at 
at the terrible Chateau d'If after having been wrongfully accused of a crime. On the wall of his lonely cell, a previous prisoner has inscribed the words, God will give me justice. The majority of my strength of composure comes directly from my unshakable faith that we have a loving Father in heaven who is just and fair. The knowledge of such a pure, simple truth is enough to carry me through anything. Miscellaneous During my interview with the representative from CBS, the question was posed to me, Do you feel that you are capable of killing someone? Until recently, the simple answer was, No. To date, I've not killed anyone, nor am I any danger to society. There really is no simple answer. I now believe that if push came to shove and my own life or the lives of my family members or loved ones were immediately threatened, that under certain circumstances I could be capable. But this, however, only conjures up a string of what-if scenarios in which, as I've learned from experience, I could only guess as to how I might act. But, unless such a scenario actually came to pass, I will never truly know, nor do I wish to find out. Among the countless things that have been posted online was the following comment. Deanna is the only girl he ever truly loved. Gee, I wonder who posted that one. Unless the words that were uttered from Travis's own lips were misrepresentative of what was truly in his heart, then that statement is untrue. Travis loved many girls, and he loved them enough to propose marriage, including Deanna, Linda, for whom he actually bought a diamond ring, me and Lisa. If I missed anyone, my apologies. Again, this is based off of what he has told me. I am not aware of all the details as to why none of these proposals ever led to marriage, but I will attest to the certainty that Deanna always held a special place in Travis's heart that no other girl there ever touched. For those who have an understanding of their history, and of all the things they shared over the course of many years, it is easy to see why. But, for whatever reason, he just couldn't bring himself to marry her. A few days before we broke up last year, we were vacationing in Huntington Beach. I remember Travis was lying on the bed, staring at the ceiling after an afternoon nap. We had been talking about hypothetical possibilities of our respective futures. In an unexplained prompting, I said, You should just marry Deanna. By this point, I already had known about his unfaithfulness, but yet had to confront him. Had yet to confront him. To me, our relationship had reached a state of limbo, and despite the pretense, I felt more at liberty to speak my mind. He gave me a strange look and said, That's weird coming from you of all people. I agreed, but wanted to know his reasoning, so I asked, Why? And he said, Because you're my girlfriend. Why would you say that? I proceeded to explain how he always told me that he knew he could be happy with Deanna, and that he knew she would always love him, and that they're already best of friends, so what's the problem? He quickly ended the conversation by changing the subject, and I was kind of glad he did. Even though I was of such an opinion, it was an awkward subject. It, it's accepted an undisputed fact that Travis never stopped loving or caring for Deanna. 
Annie wanted so much for her eternal happiness. Many people with loose lips have been very quick to judge me. Some of them have never even met me, but are allowing themselves to be influenced by hearsay and the opinions of others, or through the knowledge of only one side of a multifaceted story. Others may have known me casually through Travis or some other acquaintance or organization, but are passing judgment based on similar reasons, or have perhaps drawn their own conclusions based on what they've witnessed as far as Travis and I spending time together, which upon reading this composition will help to give them a better understanding of the hows and whys surrounding the subject. Still, others know me well through church, through school, or through business networks, and, regardless of the attacks on my character, they have remained unwavering in their friendship and support. To this latter group, you know who you are, and I cannot thank you enough. To the rest, I would think you wouldn't need reminding that we live in America, where we are innocent until proven guilty, but judge me if you must. The First Amendment is often a double-edged sword, but I will love and uphold it for as long as I call myself an American, for it is by the First Amendment that I am able to say all that I've said here. A witness, or some witnesses, are claiming to have seen a blonde at Travis's house the day he was attacked. With the kind of traffic that his house saw, I guess that's a possibility. She could have been anybody. But considering the fact that I dyed my hair back to my normal brunette color in April of 2008, just prior to my move, she obviously wasn't me. The interview asked me what it was like to be held at gunpoint. The fear that accompanies the knowledge that it could be curtains at any second is the one that tends to defy description. Each attempt I've made thus far either sounds cliched or watered down. One thing that seems to be an inherent instinct is you do whatever you're told when the one barking orders is pointing a gun in your direction. But as I began to retell it to him, the cameraman said he needed to change the tape, so we paused to give him time to do this. While we were waiting, I said, you know, Travis was held at gunpoint once at a restaurant years ago. He thought that was interesting piece of information, so he asked me to wait to tell it when the cameras started to roll again. When they did, I briefly recounted his experience. But really, such an experience is not for me to relate. Travis experienced that. It should be narrated in his own words. He said that experience inspired an entire chapter in his book. He was at first hesitant to include it because he didn't want his book to focus on himself, but on the message. But he has an important message in the form of a powerful metaphor to deliver through the retelling of that experience. I don't know if he ever wrote that chapter before he passed away, but if he didn't, then thankfully we still have a record of it. He gave a 30-minute training in San Bernardino, California in February of 2007, vividly describing this experience and the inherent lesson he gained from it. I have both an audio and a DVD recording of this training. I posted the video on YouTube under Travis Alexander Systems Training. I'm almost sure I'm not the only one with a copy of this video, and I know for certain I 
wasn't the only one present that day with a voice recorder. He had us in uproarious laughter in one moment and moved to tears the next. During some points, the audience was so captivated and stilled, you could hear a pen hit the carpeted floor. Despite his once despite his one complaint that it thoroughly drained him of his energy. When Travis was on stage, he was in his element. To Travis's family, I can only say I am truly incredibly sorry for the pain and suffering you've experienced. Family is so important, and each one is different in the structure and dynamics. But it is clear that yours is as equally close-knit as mine, and I hope that through this tragedy you've been able to be comforted by one another and by the memories that you will always have of Travis. I can imagine that you must feel so proud to count him among the members of your family. He was and will always be an amazing and special person. I know that you've already formed solid opinions of the kind of person that I am, even though you've never met me. I cannot blame you for this for one second. If the roles were reversed, I can't say I'd be reacting any differently. There are times when I wish to God that I could have done something, anything, to prevent what happened or at least made a courageous effort regardless of the consequences. I will not be able to shake the shame in this life that I've carried since that day of leaving a fallen man behind. My shame and remorse for doing so is greater than words can quantify and at times more than I can bear. I know it would bring you a great sense of closure to know that his killers were brought to justice. It is my most earnest wish that you may find the peace you so rightfully deserve. I wouldn't dare ask for your forgiveness for the way that I acted, but nevertheless, I offer all of you my sincerest apology. And I would humbly remind you that the ones responsible for this will be held accountable before the judgment seat of God, and that Travis Alexander lives, and that you will embrace him again one day when you are reunited. To my family, I honestly could not have asked God to be born into a more amazing family. I consider myself to be one of the most fortunate people on the planet to be part of a family where my cousins are more like siblings, my aunts and uncles are more like extra sets of loving parents, and my grandparents are more like my best buddies. Throughout my entire life, we have all pulled together for one another during rough times, and this has been no exception. I have lately been on the receiving end of more love than I ever thought I could possess, and so much support that has felt like a veritable wind beneath my wing, uplifting me with each new day. I grew up knowing three grandparents, and my relationship with each of them is special and unique. Because of them, I've never had to wonder what it is like to be the recipient of unconditional love. I have a beautiful big sister, Julie, whom I have loved and looked up to from the moment my eyes first found her. I especially admire her now that she has a dream job, a full-time wife and mother to a devoted husband and four beautiful children. I can vividly remember when my little brother Carl was born. I am so proud of the honest man he had become, and the life of integrity and moral uprightness.
was chosen to live. But when my little sister Angela was born, it was like Christmas. The doctor placed her in my arms before anyone else, strengthening a bond that had no doubt been formed long ago in the pre-mortal existence before either of us were ever born. My youngest brother Joseph is a living prodigy. It would sound as though I were his mother by the way I could brag about him. I always secretly wished that if I ever had a son, he would be just like Joseph. My parents may not think so at times, but they were truly a match made in heaven. Theirs has been a marriage of unwavering commitment toward each other. Truly, I have been born of goodly parents. I am so blessed and deeply grateful, for even when our differences were the most sharply contrasted, I never had to want for their love. It has been constant and ever-present. Families are the most important units on the planet. I don't know if I'll ever experience the blessing and joy of motherhood in this life or the next. But because of the rich and priceless blessings that have come my way by the grace of God through my family, I can, I can unabashedly boast that I am one of the wealthiest women ever to have been born. I love you guys, each and every one of you, and I will always love you. This entire experience has been surreal. From witnessing a horror that I've only seen happen in movies, to coming to the realization of just how deep, widespread, and far-reaching my network of support goes. People are coming out of the woodwork to support my family and me, and I'd really like to express my gratitude to these individuals. It's more than I ever could have imagined. In spite of this, I've been absolutely devastated by the death of Travis, and I'm still mourning him very much. Bits and pieces of that atrocious day have come back in spurts and flashes triggered by a sound or something someone says. It's haunting when I remember a word or a detail. It's like another piece to a puzzle of what was largely a scene of horror, chaos, and confusion. Who would hurt him? Even if I had the physical strength and capacity to do what was done to him, I would not have used much strength to harm him. I'd already hurt Travis enough emotionally, and I will always regret that. However, even his worst never called for it happened to him. And after all of this, we still do not know why it happened. Forensics can tell us what, and sometimes who, but it doesn't always tell us why. I want to know why someone would hurt him. I don't want to wait a lifetime for the answer. The truth has a way of finding daylight. I believe that one day, all things will be made known, and all of our questions will be answered. Right now, I am still having a difficult time grasping that he is no longer tangibly with us anymore. I want to give him a hug so badly, but I know he's not far away. Mostly, I have been able to remain in good cheer as a result of my strong faith that he is in a place that defies our imaginations. His passing triggered the resurfacing of many feelings I'd long ago laid to rest. Although, I never for a second stopped caring about Travis. His sister, Tanisha, said I was obsessed with him. Well, if obsessed means...
friends, I've cried every day since the inception of this nightmare. Then perhaps there is some truth to that. But I don't think obsession is the correct term. Whatever the attraction was above and beyond a friendship, it had become purely physical and 100% mutual. Travis used the term addiction, and I'd venture to say that was a little more accurate. He told me countless times through conversations, text messages, emails, and various online chatting forums that he was absolutely addicted to me. This never brought about any kind of power trip on my part. If anything, I took it as a compliment, and it hardly bears repeating yet again that I was equally susceptible to him. Our relationship was never perfect, and neither were we. Travis was a friend with whom I shared some of life's best and worst experiences. A few weeks after we broke up last summer, he told me he felt like we lived five lifetimes together because we'd shared and done so much in the short period of time that we'd known each other. And that wasn't taken into account the innumerable experiences we continued to share thereafter. And I was only one piece of Travis's life. Each friend, each family member, each person that he touched accounts for a piece that helped to comprise his life and his legacy. With the unfolding of recent events, it is clear that we are all in fact interconnected on some level, and the things we do and say affect people, circumstances, and events in a broader scope that we can at present fully comprehend. Despite the magnitude of this ineffable tragedy, many miracles have taken place as an indirect result of his passing. Travis inspired people to take a deeper look at the directions of their lives. They've reevaluated their relationships with their families and their spouses. They've reevaluated their relationship with God. New and different things have taken precedence and priority in their lives. Things that no amount of money can buy. It would please Travis to no end to know this. As one of our mutual friends put it, it may be hard to accept. Travis's message will carry far more weight and gain more momentum than it ever would have otherwise. Travis worked on building his legacy every day with simple, disciplined diligence. His legacy is now immortalized and will live on through friends and family who will never Travis was one of the most amazing people I have ever had the good fortune to know. This world is a brighter place because he was born and lived in it. If you knew Travis, consider yourself blessed. He has left an indelible mark upon this world, one that can never be erased. And he has left an imprint on my heart and the hearts of many that will remain forever. Okay. 
yelling or snoring. <laughs> Sometimes you can hear the kids out back in the neighborhood playing around. Who knows, right now it's raining. There's probably a whole bunch of uh, different noises thrown in there that maybe I should edit out, but I feel like it's going to take forever. And I feel like worked on this way too long. It took a long time, so if you're still here and you listen, thank you. I just uploaded for the um, a few people who said that they were interested in hearing her manifesto. So with that, I hope you have a, I hope you have a good, oh my god. I'm also really sick right now with a horrible upper respiratory infection and breathing's a little difficult but also do you can hear every once in a while you can hear that kind of wheezing going on I apologize so anyway like I said before I hope you have a good night and rest <laughs>